Today we will be discussing anarcho-syndicalism, a political philosophy that envisions a society where workers directly control the means of production and establish a decentralized economy free from outside hierarchical structures. We will take a look at how this philosophy got started, its key principles and at criticisms of it. In discussions on social media, I've noticed a renewed interest in this political philosophy by young tech workers who have recently been laid off. Like the industrial workers of the late 19th and early 20th century, they don't understand why their ability to earn a living is being negatively impacted by a system where ownership and control are concentrated in the hands of a privileged few who aren't directly involved in their work. A few heated exchanges on this topic, especially on Reddit, inspired this video. Let's start from the beginning, how did the political philosophy of anarcho-syndicalism get started? The seeds of anarcho-syndicalism can be traced back to the mid-19th century, with the writings of French anarchist Pierre-Joseph Proudhon and Russian anarchist Mikhail Bakunin. Both thinkers emphasize the importance of workers organizing themselves into unions to challenge capitalist exploitation. As it emerged, anarcho-syndicalism drew inspiration from both anarchism and syndicalism, two distinct but overlapping political philosophies. Anarchism, with its emphasis on individual liberty, social equality, and the rejection of hierarchical structures, provided the ideological foundation for anarcho-syndicalism's vision of a worker-controlled society. Syndicalism, with its focus on labor unions and direct action, offered practical strategies for workers to organize and challenge the existing capitalist system. In the late 19th century, anarcho-syndicalism began to take shape as a distinct political movement, particularly in France and Spain. The French General Confederation of Labor and the Spanish National Confederation of Labor emerged as leading anarcho-syndicalist organizations. The early 20th century marked a period of significant growth and influence for anarcho-syndicalism. The movement played a crucial role in the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the Spanish Civil War of 1936-1939. In Russia, anarcho-syndicalist workers' militias played a vital role in the initial stages of the revolution. However, the Bolshevik faction ultimately suppressed the anarcho-syndicalist movement, establishing a centralized state-controlled economy and placing significant limits on individual liberty. In Spain, anarcho-syndicalism reached its zenith during the Spanish Civil War. The CNTFAI an alliance of anarcho-syndicalists and anarchists, briefly controlled vast territories in Catalonia, experimenting with worker self-management and social revolution. However, the Francoist forces eventually defeated the Republicans, leading to the brutal suppression of anarcho-syndicalism in Spain. The Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, sometimes called the Wobblies, was a radical labor union founded in 1905 in Chicago. The IWW's revolutionary industrial unionism, its emphasis on direct action and its internationalist outlook all contributed to the growth of anarcho-syndicalist ideas. The IWW's revolutionary industrial unionism, a form of unionism that organizes workers across all industries rather than by craft or skill, was a major departure from traditional trade unionism. This approach aimed to unite workers from all walks of life, regardless of their background or occupation, in a common struggle against the capitalist system. The IWW's emphasis on direct action, which included strikes, boycotts, and other forms of protest, was another key influence on anarcho-syndicalism. The IWW believed that workers could not rely on political parties or government reform to achieve their goals. Instead, they needed to take direct action to challenge the power of employers and the state. The IWW declined during World War I and into the 1920s as their more radical approach lost members to more conservative labor organizations like the AFL and CIO. They were also impacted by the Red Scare that resulted in the organization's suppression in the US and Canada. Following World War II, anarcho-syndicalism faced decline in many parts of the world. 
social programs, worker safety regulations and improved corporate management structures and methods in capitalist societies along with cooperative unionization improve the satisfaction level of the vast majority of workers. This trend, along with a growing middle class and reduced economic inequality limited the movement's growth. Also, the US-Soviet Cold War made anything associated with socialism unattractive to many in the West. However, anarcho-syndicalism remained active in some countries, particularly in Spain and Argentina. The CNT, despite its suppression under Franco's regime, re-emerged as a significant force in Spanish labor movements during the transition to democracy in the late 1970s. In Argentina, the Forjadores Argentinos emerged as a prominent anarcho-syndicalist union, playing a crucial role in labor struggles and social movements throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. In recent decades, anarcho-syndicalism has experienced a resurgence of interest, particularly among younger activists and those disillusioned with traditional political and economic structures. The political philosophy has been associated with various social movements, including the Global Justice, Occupy Wall Street, and the anti-austerity protests in Europe. So, what are the cornerstones of anarcho-syndicalist thought? At its core, Anarcho-syndicalism envisions a society where workers organize themselves into democratically structured unions and federations, forming a web of interconnected associations that oversee production and address economic needs. These unions would not only negotiate wages and working conditions but would also actively participate in decision-making processes that shape their industries and the broader society. Anarcho-syndicalists view direct action as the primary tool for achieving their social and economic goals. They reject the notion that meaningful change can be brought about solely through electoral processes or reliance on existing institutions of power, including traditional unions. Instead, they advocate for a range of direct action tactics, including strikes, boycotts, occupations, autonomous zones and other forms of collective resistance. This emphasis on direct action reflects anarcho-syndicalist belief in the power of workers to collectively challenge and reshape the existing order. They view direct action as a means to break the grip of capitalism and the state, empowering workers to take control of their own destinies. Anarcho-syndicalists are staunchly opposed to capitalism, which they see as a system that exploits workers and concentrates wealth in the hands of a few. Instead, they advocate for worker self-management and empowering workers to make decisions. They think that this will eliminate the exploitation inherent in capitalist systems. They believe that this will serve as a means to achieve a more just and equitable society. Worker control holds that workers should have the power to make decisions about their workplaces, including production methods, working conditions, and the distribution of profits. This would encompass a range of mechanisms and strategies aimed at transferring decision-making power from employers to workers in the workplace and throughout the economy. Anarcho-syndicalism also envisions a decentralized society, where self-governing unions and federations replace the centralized authority of the state, fostering local autonomy and democratic decision-making. In a broader sense, they believe that this form of economic democracy will lead to a more just and equitable distribution of wealth and resources. However, they also reject the notion of a state governed by a ruling elite, viewing it as an instrument of oppression that serves its own selfish and corrupt interests and stifles worker control. If you have read George Orwell's Animal Farm, this was the assertion he made at the end of the book. This view has often put them at odds with proponents of other socialist political theories, such as communism, that think top-down bureaucratic control is the best method. Anarcho-syndicalism promotes international cooperation among workers, recognizing that the struggle against exploitation transcends national boundaries and requires united action. One recent convergence of philosophies was the formation of green syndicalism, a mix of anarcho-syndicalism and green environmentalism. This new movement seeks to integrate environmental concerns into the broader anarcho-syndicalist framework, advocating for worker control not only to address economic injustices but also to promote environmental sustainability. As with any political philosophy, 
especially one that embraces both socialism and, from time to time, violence, anarcho-syndicalism has attracted considerable criticism. Now, let's take a look at these points of contention. Critics argue that the decentralized structure of anarcho-syndicalism could lead to inefficiency and decision-making paralysis. Coordinating complex industries and economies across multiple organizations could pose significant challenges. Capitalists believe that this is better managed by free market cooperation and investment. Collectivist socialists believe that this is best dealt with by the authority of a strong state. This also leads into the question of the ability to effectively scale to manage modern, globally interconnected economies. The complexities of international trade, finance, and technology may require centralized decision-making that anarcho-syndicalism's decentralized approach might struggle to accommodate. Both capitalist and communist critics advocate for a strong state authority to handle these things. Critics also state that such a society would have problems dealing with external threats such as natural disasters, economic crises, or foreign aggression. The decentralized structure could make it difficult to mobilize resources and coordinate a unified response. Both capitalist and communist critics have mentioned this as an issue. Critics on both the left and right assert that the peaceful transition from a capitalist system to an anarcho-syndicalist society is unrealistic. They argue that the existing power structures of capitalism would fiercely resist such a radical shift, inevitably leading to violent conflicts. They point to the Spanish Civil War, CIA-sponsored Operation Condor repressions in South America as well as other conflicts as examples. Anarcho-syndicalism's economic framework is sometimes considered vague and lacking in detail. Critics question how anarcho-syndicalist economies would handle issues such as resource allocation, logistics, pricing mechanisms and conflict resolution between various groups. They assert that these things would be ripe for conflict between minority and majority interests, especially if minority rights were ignored. They further argue that a strong central authority is needed to deal with these things. They point to what happened in the Balkans after the collapse of Yugoslavia as an example. Some critics point out that anarcho-syndicalism's primary focus is on traditional labor. This raises questions about how it would address broader social and political issues such as education, healthcare, and environmental protection. Once again, this might also create conflict between competing interests. Green syndicalism is an example of an attempt to address this concern. While anarcho-syndicalism aims to eliminate hierarchy, critics argue that we have historically seen the complex structure of unions lead to the emergence of a new bureaucracy that doesn't always have the interest of the rank and file at heart. They hold that forming tribal hierarchies is a strong human trait that wishful thinking can't overcome. Some believe that the rapid pace of technological advancement poses a challenge for anarcho-syndicalism. A lot of the principles of the philosophy were designed around early 20th century industrial workers, not 21st century information workers. The movement would need to find ways to adapt its principles and structures to accommodate new technologies and the changing nature of work. They see this as why unionization attempts targeting technical workers have largely failed. So, what's my take on anarcho-syndicalism? Overall, it's mixed. I agree with the general idea of limited bureaucratic control, either from a massive corporation or a large state. I think there are strong benefits to voluntary cooperation and self-organization. I also agree that increasing economic inequality is being caused by the concentration of power and wealth in the hands of a few well-connected elites. However, I also agree with critics on several points, primarily in that it ignores some of the unsavory aspects of human nature. I have concerns that such a system would turn out to be overly restrictive and detrimental to individual freedom. I also believe that small voluntary markets and individual entrepreneurship, which are now often heavily restricted and regulated by both capitalist and collectivist powers, are more efficient and equitable means of organizing economic activity. Lastly, I have worries about the violence that has often been associated with these movements. 
What are your thoughts on anarcho-syndicalism? Do you see it as a path to an equitable, participatory and ecologically sustainable society? Or, do you think it's a misguided, dangerous and violent ideology that's best left in the past? Or, do you, like me, see it as a mixed bag and the subject of a funny scene in Monty Python's Holy Grail movie? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Please give me a like if you enjoyed this video and please comment to let me know your thoughts on it. Also, check out our other videos about other philosophical topics.